The Maasai are a semi-nomadic indigenous ethnic group that's recognized for their unique leaping dance, colorful dress, and peculiar customs. They reside in the game parks surrounding the African Great Lakes and northern Tanzania, as well as the northern, central, and southern regions of Kenya. The reverence that the Maasai have for the animals that they herd and hunt, as well as the savannas that they call home, was so compelling to Stephanie Fuchs, who was born in Germany, that she's chosen to live the traditional Maasai way of life for the past 20 years. Some of their practices, such as drinking raw kettle blood, may be quite far outside of what is considered to be the norm in Western culture. Because we've been Stephanie's followers on Instagram for the past few years, we were really interested in learning more about her story. She was nice enough to share with the media the story of how she met her husband, the challenges she had to overcome in order to acclimatize to the Maasai way of life, as well as her more general ideas about the Maasai in relation to her drive to protect the environment. Stephanie was born in a small village not far from Frankfurt, which is also where she and her mother made their home. She was 19 years old when she first left Germany to go traveling. She began her journey by traveling around Australia after which she moved to England to obtain a degree in biology and conservation with the intention of eventually working in the field of conservation and making a positive impact on the planet. Stephanie went ahead and signed herself up as a volunteer with the same British non-governmental organization, or NGO, in Tanzania, where she'd previously applied for a job but was ultimately unsuccessful. She was working at a study camp on Mafia Island, which is located south of Zanzibar Island, when she made her first acquaintance with Sukhoin, who is now her husband. He was a security guard at a dive center, and I recall thinking that he was very handsome while he was working there. By this point, Stephanie had already been living in Tanzania for a year and had acquired a working knowledge of Swahili, the language most commonly spoken in Tanzania, they began dating approximately two months after their initial encounter and eventually tied the knot the following year. Stephanie moved in with Sequoin's extended family in their traditional Maasai home so that she could continue to be with Sequoin. You must be curious about the Maasai way of life and what it entails on a daily basis. I was as well, and thankfully, Stephanie was gracious enough to share some specifics about her typical daily activities with me. Before I became active on social media and before I had my son, I had a hard time fighting off feelings of boredom. I was still thinking in a Western perspective, but now I see that there's always something I may be doing. To be able to simply sit and think, to contemplate and reflect is a real gift, and having the leisure to do so is a pleasure. The Maasai people live a fairly sedentary lifestyle. She gets up at seven in the morning and drinks chai for breakfast, she takes care of the goats and then releases them from their enclosure so they can roam free. Meanwhile, she gets her son ready for school. Following lunch, between the hours of 12 and 1, the ladies have some free time, during which they work on beadwork for the dream catchers, sew, and collect wood for the cooking. Also, Stephanie uses this time to concentrate on her social media, and in order to do so, she'll go on adventures and shoot photographs. Stephanie tells us that she's still getting used to the way of life in the Maasai culture, despite the fact that she's settled into life with her new family and tribe. I'm now in a position where I can claim that I'm comfortable, which is something that I could not have said five years ago. It took me a considerable amount of time. Even though Stephanie was fluent in Swahili, she was frequently excluded from conversations with Maasai people because the Maasai spoke Ma, which is the traditional language of their tribe. She also struggled with the cultural norm that husbands and couples should not spend an excessive amount of time together. Sukoin's brothers were never far away. In fact, Stephanie and Sukoin frequently found themselves sharing a bed with each of Sukoin's siblings. And while she hoped that becoming a mother would alter this, she was surprised to find that it had a very different and unanticipated impact. The birth of our kid drove a wedge between Sukoin and I, but it drew me closer to the women in his family particularly his mother. Learning the Ma tribal language was made possible for me by spending a significant amount of time with my mother-in-law. A further modification involved the alteration of the physical environment. Stephanie experienced multiple bouts of illness. It's hardly surprising that after a year of dealing with everything from sepsis in her leg to malaria and amoeba, 
Stephanie decided that she had simply had enough and desired to return to Germany. Adjustment was required on all levels, psychologically, emotionally, and physically. It was necessary to make a few minor adjustments in order for her body to become accustomed to the new physical surroundings. Due to the fact that this was not the norm for her, she needed access to potable water that had been purified. Consuming from the same water sources as the Maasai, who only consume clean drinking water, would not be beneficial to a body that's been properly nourished with clean drinking water. The health of the whole family has improved as a result of the installation of the water tank that's now shared by all members of the household. In addition to that, she was required to have a gas stove installed. The Maasai prepare their food using firewood, but the smoke from the cooking caused Stephanie to suffer from a number of pulmonary problems. Sequoin was quite agreeable with these minor alterations. He prioritized her comfort over maintaining his cultural traditions. These relatively minor adjustments may be made so long as Stephanie did not in any way violate the society in which she was living. It was more the features of the culture that placed a high value on certain things that Stephanie needed to adjust to. Having lived with them for 20 years, I can state that conservationism is ingrained in the Maasai culture from birth. Not privileged white people who pursue a degree in conservation and biology tainted with a Western capitalist worldview are true conservationists. Rather, true conservationists are the indigenous people who belong to a land. Stephanie explains to us that the Maasai people, much like the Australian Aboriginals and the Aboriginal Americans in the United States, make an effort to live in peace with the natural environment that's all around them in order to help preserve it. They have a natural understanding of how to care for the natural world, having been raised in it from birth. They maintain a close relationship with the natural environment, in contrast to a large portion of the Western world. The problem with conservation is that it's managed by people in the Western world who aren't necessarily qualified to maintain the natural environment that we live in. Indigenous cultures who live inside nature are more knowledgeable about how to protect nature than we are. Despite the fact that we have degrees in biology and conservation and have studied the natural world, the WWF is forcibly removing indigenous communities, in many cases using violence. In Brazil, indigenous people are being relocated so that oil may be drilled, which is for the sake of economic progress that isn't even helping us develop. The Maasai are being driven off their land in Nagorongoro and the Serengeti in order to make way for safaris and the hunting culture that goes along with them. It all goes back to the concept of white supremacy, which is the notion that individuals of white ethnicity believe they have the authority to determine the course of events in other countries. In point of fact, the Maasai herdsmen graze their livestock alongside zebras and other wild creatures in the crater, demonstrating that it's possible for people and other animals to dwell peacefully. Stephanie contends that there's an imperialist undercurrent to the practice of conservation that can be traced back to the colonial era. Even if there's no such thing as colonialism in the modern world, there is something called conservation that masquerades as a good thing but actually causes more harm to developing countries like Tanzania and slows down their economic growth even further. Also, Stephanie shared with us some of her ideas on the consumption of meat in the Maasai culture and Western culture by comparing and contrasting the two. It makes perfect sense to adopt a plant-based diet when you consider how animals are raised for meat in Western countries. On the other hand, keeping cattle is a sustainable way of life for the Maasai. The cows do not cause any damage to the trees, and the people who herd cattle in forested areas are actually helping to preserve the land. In order to obtain protein, the Maasai consume the blood of cows. This practice is considered vegetarian because the cows are not slaughtered in the process. Rather, the blood is drawn from the cows in the same manner that it would be drawn from a human donor of blood. A lot of people think that the Maasai are to blame for global warming because of the methane gas that's created by their cattle and the fact that they overgraze their land. Stephanie contends that the reason for overgrazing is not the concentration of cattle in a given region, but rather the fact that the cattle spend an excessive amount of time there, primarily due to the fact that they have nowhere else to go. The Maasai have access to less and less territory as time goes on, in part because of incursions made by other tribes 
and in part because of their own excessive population. According to Stephanie, the farmers that cultivate vegetables for vegan cuisine are the ones responsible for destroying water sources and trees. You may be vegan in the Western world while still enjoying meals in the same way that meat eaters do because you can walk into a store and buy vegan meat. This is the problem with being vegan in the Western world. And most of the time, the individuals who consume vegan meats won't be concerned about where it's coming from or the possible damage that it may be doing to the environment. Stephanie, who has lived among the Maasai for some time, has gained some insight into the ways in which the Maasai way of life might be protected as a result of her experiences. Even though they have access to less land, their culture is inextricably linked to agriculture due to the fact that they keep cattle. They continue to have a large number of children, despite the fact that there is insufficient land available. This cannot continue. Stephanie is afforded the privilege of being aware of these things as a result of the education she's received. The Messiah have never used the use of birth control in their culture. She does her best, whenever it's feasible, to share with them the information that she has concerning family planning in the hopes of assisting them in the preservation of their culture in its purest form. If they choose to continue living in the manner in which they do, it's imperative for them to exercise birth control. In addition to this, she urges the people in her community to contemplate issues such as how and where they'll live in a significant number of years from now, how they'll maintain themselves, and how they'll create money for themselves. Stephanie is firmly of the opinion that a greater amount of respect should be shown to our indigenous cultures. They are the true guardians of our world, and we have a responsibility to defend them whenever their rights are infringed upon. What do you think of the relationship and the love between Stephanie and her husband and her life in Africa?